Podcast. That's not true. We're the same podcast. Same exact podcast. Welcome to Crash Chords. I, of course, am Matt. I'm John. And I am Steve. It is the new season. We're kicking it off with a bang, one of my choices. Um, <laughs> That's a... <laughs> what? Your choice is a bang, naturally. Obviously. Ipso facto, bang. Yeah. Well, duh. We, They're not we snoozers bring, like yours. We bring oh, whimpers. Not I, snoozers. I had a, I had a snoozers. Street. Oh, it lasted like They're years. Whimpers. You had a streak for like the until we figured out what we were doing and brought on quality music. <laughs> oh, you mean until you learned from me? Yes, we did and learn my, from you. And my better choices, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I made a face at John. Forget it. <laughs> anyway, um, my choice this week is Florence and the Machine. Um, they've come up a few times on the podcast. They are my brightest diamond or my St. Vincent. My, my choices. Yeah. See? <laughs> Shut it's up. Just proven they're, it. They're proven it. So Florence yeah. and the Machine, it's another band that's female fronted. The the singer is a singer, songwriter, composer, pop artist. Mm-hmm. And um, I first fell in love with them with a song off their first album, Lungs, called Cosmic Love. Um, it's one of those songs that just has a powerful percussion section and beautiful vocals. It kind of this sweeping almost space epic of a song. And with a song like Cosmic Love, you would expect. Um, it's one of those songs that brings tears to my eyes every time I listen to it. Cause it's powerful and emotional, especially if you're in love. It's one of those songs that invokes those feelings. Um, so I'd heard they had a new record coming out. They're a band that I've been hearing about for a while, since the mid-2000s when they came out. But for whatever reason, I thought their legacy was further than that. I don't know, something about their presentation or how great even that first record sounded. I thought they were around longer, but it turns out they only have three full-length studio records. Um, I definitely see why you may be thinking that there was there's there's a lot of like old school themes throughout this whole album and they, also because they got a lot of radio play yeah so you know it's it's there in the minds of the masses so anyway i thought it was my turn to bring on a um touted female vocalist that i quite love um to see if their newest record holds up i do enjoy that first record i don't quite remember the second record so the third record i'm kind of coming into pretty fresh yeah, this, no, this is a, a nice way to start season four of the Crash Chords podcast. That record, by the way, of course, is called How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful. The one we're doing today, of yes. course. Well, a little background here. Florence and the Machine uh, is an English indie rock band, and they've been going strong, true, only since about 2007. They were formed primarily by Florence Welsh, singer, songwriter, and namesake, uh, and also longtime collaborator, keyboardist... Isabella Summers, who technically shares the namesake, as she sometimes went by the alias... Isa Machine. Isa, I don't know if that's like Isa Machine or Isa Machine, but that was actually a nickname that Florence Welsh gave her for her electronic music skills, uh, going along with being a keyboardist. So the progenitor of the group was actually Florence Robot Isa Machine, purely as a duo originally, and then they shortened that name due to wordiness, uh, Florence didn't like it, and then they tacked on additional members after that, which have grown to include Robert Ackroyd on guitar and backing vocals, Chris Hyden on drums and backing vocals, Mark Saunders on bass and backing vocals, and finally Tom Munger on harp. Wow, they have a devoted of harp player. things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, apart from that, I'll say this for the group. They're one of the big names. They're a testament to the whole paradigm lately of creative indie artists who essentially get inducted into the pop scene. As we've explained in previous episodes, indie's pretty big right now. In a sense, it's the new pop, or at least it's comfortably sat within and under pop for over 15 years now. And something that really enhances that spotlight is the presence of a strong central figure, or stage image. In this case, that's Florence. Vocally, Florence's singing has been described by Rolling Stone as dark, robust, and romantic. She's been compared to singers like Kate Bush and Bjork. So you get that fusion of pop on one hand and art rock on the other very clearly as exemplified by those two artists. And then visually, she's got this whole like crazy redhead thing going on. Self-described, in fact, as the Lady of Shallot, that's a Tennyson reference, meets Ophelia, obviously a Hamlet reference, meets scary gothic bat lady. 
<laughs> which is not a reference. So yeah, you mix that whole image together with the songwriting, which is very Renaissance influenced, religiously influenced, mixed with a tight band and some catchy hooks, and it's no wonder why the pop community took a shine to them in a big way. But what did they have to show on their latest album? How big? How blue? How beautiful? We'll find out. The interesting thing here, though, is the way she self-describes herself, this full-length record, this brand-new record, has a similar theme to the other female artists I had mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. The, it, it totally focuses on that artist. Her The album cover is a black-and-white photo of Florence looking very casual. Um, I, it looks like she's not wearing a ton of makeup, kind of just very casual, casual, very natural. And while My Brightest Diamond and St. Vincent's, those covers were more uh, spectacle-ish... They, it was still just them and focused on those people. So I think it's interesting. Yeah, it's image, but also you might be making a bit of a, a, a foreshadow here because, after all, that is also the mark of a personal album, you know, sure. that, that nature of having that kind of cover here. We've had that several times over the course of, of these episodes. And you those know, two albums, other records were very personal. Two others, yep. My Brightest Diamond and St. Vincent, they were very, very personal. So, yeah, this, this at least starts off, if you're just judging it on the cover, it starts off in the same fashion. Uh, shall we begin? Yes. So the first track is Ship to Wreck. Um, we start with a uh, very interesting percussion work that kind of takes us right into the intro of the track, and it doesn't take a long lead time till we get to the first verse. True. It's, it's pretty quick. It's really just that like basic pop hook, uh, a kind of like keyboard, double with the bass, very upbeat, but really, yeah, after just two phrases, we're in the verse. Very, very quick. The verses themselves did kind of maintain the same character, except, of course, they're joined by the vocals now, which are filled with character in their own right. There's a lot of talent there in Florence's singing, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, in early critique, right up front here, I was not thrilled with the melodies initially in these verses. They were clearly just a vessel at this point for the words uh, to to grab you more so. Things started to change as we get toward the end of the verse, and a pre-chorus uh takes hold, and that contains one of the highlights, I think, of the song, the, that high note that she hits. First phrase there, and oh, my love, remind me. What was it that I said? And right there on that, oh, it's, it's, it's the way she holds that note. It's, she holds it followed by a vibrato, and there's like a very climactic uh, dragging it out. And it's, it's the kind of note that you go back to. It's clearly the climax of the entire piece, in a way. It's the note that you wait for in each and every uh, iteration of these choruses. It's also when we start really... Besides just understanding the dynamic of the vocalist, we're starting to actually see the imagery coming forth in the lyrical work. And this is something that right away is starting to be starting to capture my imagination. Don't touch the sleeping pills, they mess with my head, dredging the great white sharks swimming in the bed. I mean, you're already making some pretty heavy metaphors. And I'll stop there, and here comes a killer whale to sing me to sleep, thrashing the covers off it has me by its teeth. So yeah, it's 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 in a way like romantic style writing. Well, what I also really like about the metaphor here is that this comparison of ship re- meaning a physical ship and also yeah. meaning a relationship, like that's not coincidence and it's obvious from the beginning, but I like the wordplay. True, you know. but it's and yet it's not the first uh, instance where the word wreck has been used to such avail. Yes, uh, Miley Cyrus reference. Yes, and to continue on the pre-chorus, the next line: "I can't help but pull the earth around me to make my bed." That right there, that's a very heavy symbolic gesture of sort of digging your own grave, but it's not presented in such a way. It's not presented with that sort of darkness. Because of the jauntiness of the tune, because of the, the very present bass being a little more uplifting than what I normally would expect, this keeps it from, from just sort of being, I did a mistake, even though the metaphor is being used in a little bit of an unusual way. Well, it's also the nature. I mean, I, I mentioned that I wasn't thrilled with the, the melody initially, you know, although that changed. But that's probably why. When you look at some of these lyrics, you know, she has this, like, storytelling style. It, just to, like, start it off, this is a single track. This is not the more art rock side of her that I that I uh, hinted at earlier on. That comes later. But as far as an opening track is concerned, this is uh, a bit of a safer route. But still, you peer into that, and you get past the melody, and there is a story behind this that's very, very rich. And then by the time she gets the chorus, and oh, my love, remind me, what was it that I said? I can't help but pull the earth around me to make my bed. And I just love that, that to pull the earth around me. I mean, it's, that's, that's gorgeous. And oh, my love, remind me, what was it that I did? Did I drink too much? Am I losing touch? Did I build the ship to wreck? So yeah, it's... She She's got a command of the English language. That's very clear. Um, 
but also the thing is the chorus it, it fuses the two quality elements present um her vocals for one and then of course uh the same hook that we got earlier on just for those two phrases it brings that back together both together in a big way such that by the time you get to the chorus you're repeating it it's it's and I, I hate to make this reference, but it's almost like the way in which she goes to that same thing over and over, the, the way she she emphasizes the word wreck in the same manner she emphasized the word O oh, uh, back in the pre-chorus, it, it's it's this this highlight. It's this, this thing that she goes back to just as we experienced, although in this case uh, more negatively, and with the Fallout Boy, and you'll remember me for centuries, <laughs> that word that hits that height and it returns every time, and sooner or later it's it's just stuck in your head. Can't escape it. Well, the difference is between Fallout Boy and this is that the instrumentation is doing a little bit more, and on top Clearly. of that, what I really like about the instrumentation in this song is even though it does kind of uh, repeat on itself, it's got enough going on that that plus the vocal hook, I mean, really kind of sucks you in. And it's a toe-tapping song, as cheesy as it sounds. It really is one of those songs that gets your foot tapping, and you kind of just kind of get caught up in it. Until it culminates in a breakdown. Yeah. Um, actually, there is a brief bridge there, but it's nothing to speak of. It still, again, maintains mostly the same character, and it's very short. But then finally, the breakdown occurs, and these elements get stripped down to just acoustic guitar. Uh, the bass is much more prominent, and then the, the drums start building, and then it's back to the chorus. Within this, there's also some other examples of the instrumentation you're mentioning, just these delicate harmonies stepping in, which I'm not mm -hmm. sure is, is Florence doubling herself or whether it's maybe Issa stepping forward as a, a fellow backing vocalist. But it's absolutely beautiful. You know, just a little example of her uh, expertise at harmonization, which comes in in a much bigger way later in the album. I also really like that this song has that kind of folk country structure, but it's a pop version. So think of the more pop um, December stuff we've talked about, or even, I mean, we've covered a ton of folk acts that lean toward the pop side, and this definitely has that also. It's not completely straight up pop, but structurally it absolutely is. Yeah. All said and done, it, it does promote a excellent introduction to the album without offering us something that's wildly out of left field. Yeah, it's a solid it's a opening completely track. Approachable. Yeah. But yeah, there's nothing particularly new here. There's nothing alluring yet, I think, on an album scale. I It would be a pleasant soundtrack to some like solo department store shopping, I think. Um, as I've this Which is, is your go-to comparison. It's my, well, to be honest, it's a little bit different here. This is solo department store shopping, I and you're see. going to enjoy it. You're gonna have a good shopping experience, and well, JCPenney will be very happy to have them on there. You, you can't fair, make I, me. I don't mind shopping at JCPenney because their T-shirts are dirt cheap and decent quality, and they have really good overshirts. Yes, they do have really good overshirts. Yes. I would agree. All right, well, so we just gave a, a shameless pitch. Let's go to track two. What kind of man? So what I love about this song from the minute it starts is the way she doubles her vocals on this. So we got into a pretty heavy discussion about this, also with my wife off the air, because listening to it. Though I'm inclined to believe what Sarah said about it just being her voice doubled, it, it really sounds like it could go either way. Her voice, it's, it's a high, her higher voice that we're already used to listening to from the first track, doubled with something much deeper. And it sounded like it could have been a male vocalist as well, but it, it definitely has some kind of vocalization on it. And this is only like part of the, like the broad things that are going on here. Yeah. I'll get back to that because this is clearly more of an arty kickoff. Yeah. I mean, more broadly, just like obvious at a, at a glance, this is due to the sudden like ambient approach here and, and the vocals that strike me as being very caught in the daze between those two different tracks. Uh, or at least stricken with reflection and soliloquy, despite the fact that there are dual vocals, which right. negates soliloquy, but still it sounds that way. Also, we're completely lacking in percussion here, mm -hmm. at least for a good while, and that's quite strange given what we just left. But there is a rhythm present in the elements that remain. And of course, what remains is this perfect unison between those two vocalists, presumably Florence and the male backup, or yeah, perhaps it's herself, but fed through a vocalizer for sure. The two tracks, though, they seem to be set an octave apart, but that's about it. Everything else, the accents, the dynamics, the whole approach here is nearly identical, with perhaps the only other difference being that Florence is slightly more prominent, or because of the strange vocalizer, the other sounds, uh, the other sounds kind of like a, a distorted reflection of her own character. The other element present in this intro is the solo synth which is just these long drones lacking any intermittent percussiveness whatsoever. Instead, the rhythmic reaction that you get here is present in the vocals and their accents. You'll find that they might, like, forge a steady beat for the segment of a phrase, and then in its midst they'll take the and instead of the downbeat, at which point, at least on a first listen, you won't 
tap along. You can't tap along. You're just ensnared by the mysticism of it all because our ears are so accustomed to having percussion for context. Without that context, this creates the illusion of a freeform vocal rhythm with the added eeriness of wondering how something so freeform could be so in sync between the two vocalists, further hinting that it may very well just be herself, doubling herself, but with that heavy vocalization effect. Still, it's not freeform. That's the thing. It's nothing of the kind. It's just Old Faithful 4-4 four, four, and a creative 4-4 four, four at that. In fact, if you start counting at the beginning, start on 3 then it, it's just that two-beat pickup, and then the synth begins on one, and you'll find it's just this slow 4-4. Four, four. But you have to provide the beat. There's no beat to speak of. I love that intro. I lo- love that, that arty side of her. This is what she excels at, and her melodies will follow this even in a bigger way. And then they start introducing things like the kick drum, the O's in the background, which yeah. none of this is really starting to come off as cliche. It's really just a, a natural extension of what her vocals are doing. It's, it's playing off of the quivers. It's playing off the lilts that she's putting in there. And all this is starting to really just be a very slow but enjoyable build, a very, very solid burn towards something. Well, you know, it's, it's all a matter of perspective, because in a way there is kind of like, I don't want to call it the bass drop, but there is a sudden moment there where everything does kind of pick up. I mean, for instance, there is, you do get a little bit of a stepwise fashion, I agree with that. Like, for instance, later as it picks up a little bit, the synth starts hammering out every beat, and that's how you start, you know, getting it more in your head. Oh yeah, it's very clearly in 4-4. That would be the dead giveaway. But the vocals, you're right, they stray even further. She fills them with lilts, and the accents themselves are fiercely independent of this time signature, but they're so dynamic, and at the same time so inquisitive. What kind of man loves like this? What kind of man? And the end the emphases here are just, you know, they feel filled with, with longing, maybe regret what kind of man loves like this. But also, it almost feels like it's what kind of man does this, you know. She, it's, it's a series of men that she's looking at, like right now in this single image. It's not a one man. It's, it's like everything has just come to... to uh, a crux? Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's let's focus on the content for a bit, or the story, as you will, because this is a perfect connection to Ship Turek, obviously, which is about metaphor and relationship. This is like that next level, not even just looking at a personal relationship, but just all men. What, you know, what kind of, or just a man in general, not all men, but a man, not, not a specific man, and how he loves and why, what kind of man loves like this. You know, it's, it's a different perspective. But it's related to the previous expre- uh, perspective, which I really like. And it's, it's also comparing the, the idea of the man to a specific individual and trying to figure out, like, what makes this person unique. It's, it's even further than that. You take that verse in the beginning and, and talk about taking that sip from light. I already had a sip, so I reasoned I was drunk enough to deal with it. And then you were on the other side. Like always, you can never make your mind. That the next line, the the pre-chorus that she goes into, mm-hmm. and with one kiss you inspire a fire of devotion that lasted twenty years. What kind of man loves like this? That's powerful. And the way it's sung, the the emphasis, her her just dynamic range that's going on right here, to go from slightly softer to this like crux, the heights. Ooh, ooh, you could tell he did something. Just dramatic. It's also got some shameless wordplay in here. To let me dangle at a cruel angle. Oh, my feet don't touch the floor. Sometimes you're half in, then you're half out, but never close the door. Love that. She's very poetic. She she knows how to shape words to create strong images. It's what she'd done in the previous records that I really like. You're not just getting an idea of something. She's putting you in a place and steeping you in emotion, and I love that. Absolutely. But let's talk about the latter half of this track, because, of course, that really is it really steps away completely. There is that moment in which uh, it picks up, and at this point, it's pure indie rock. It's not really arty at this at this time. It's the kick drum is there. You're right with that, and then suddenly the the male vocalists step in the background with a bunch of oohs. All that is is present here. It's filled with a lot more attitude. It even has a little R and B element. So her vocals have also made this shift from the softer edge yeah. to a much stronger, more uh, self assured. Yes, and definitely. that that shift is it, it's subtle because it creeps up on you. But when it when she really starts going full force with it, with not just you know the kick drum, the O's, but also the horns start coming in. When all this starts getting together, it's a very powerful force. What I like about Florence as a singer is that when she gets belty, the way she carries notes and transitions from notes, I just I love the structure 
of her voice and how she carries it. She's a talented vocalist who knows her complete range and can kind of go anywhere, which is always entertaining. And it sometimes seems as if the instruments themselves kind of mimic that same mm-hmm. behavior. Like, I noticed that later in a verse, the guitars take this very, very bright tone, and then all of a sudden we transition to the bridge, and the phrases, they, they're a lot warmer. Reflecting exactly what she's doing, uh, the music does the same thing. It's, it's, it's really quite quite uh, astute, I think. She knows what she's doing throughout this entire track. I think, as far as a second track, this was a, a bigger success as far as I'm concerned. This this pulled me and this made me curious to see what else she can do in the album. But I think it was only strong because of the track that came before it. I think that pairing really worked well together. Yeah. Which is curious because this track, What Kind of Man, was the first single and Ship to Wreck was the second single. It's an interesting pairing, not just as part of the album, but to have your first two songs be your first two singles, and to have them so dynamically divergent. Yeah. As far as... uh, Content, though, they're strung together, and I think that's what makes it really interesting here. Yeah, from a marketing point of view, it actually is pretty prevalent, because both of these songs, even before I kind of really knew who Florence was, I had already heard these songs a lot on the radio, and I enjoyed them both, and didn't actually know it was the same musician. Not not like off the cuff, not from the same album. Right. Well, I will say that however intrigued I was by this track, I don't think it came close to how intrigued I was by the third track. How big, how blue, how beautiful. This is the title track. And it starts off with similar things, again, with the very broad melodies that seem to sort of evade uh, the structure of the rhythm. Uh, but the rhythm here is definitely crisper. You have the guitar punctuation. It seems a little bit more uplifting, though, and less soul-piercing than the intro to the previous track. But the intro here is a little more stripped down. It's mostly just a piano, guitar, and vocals. There's not much else beyond that, at least in the very beginning. Yeah. It but- feels a little more hollow, a little more empty, not, you know, kind of giving a vastness. Well, but the previous track, in a way, the intro to the previous track was That's hollower. True. That's you know, true. you have some, you have tightness here. That's in true. fact, it's her melody that is the most uh, consistent from the one track into the other. It's the most experimental. Uh, she doesn't want to really keep her vocals tight and regular because that would be boring. It seems like she draws emotional freedom from writing her melodies that way. She accentuates her breath marks, which many vocalists would otherwise try to conceal. So it's just a little tactic that I find her using here, and it makes me real. I'm always lured in by a great melody, and she has that to go with, along with great deliveries. Yeah, and that's that's what probably my favorite point because as she's singing, the speed, the varying, and the just the way she crunches some lyrics and elongates other ones, mm-hmm. it really does a great job of emphasizing what parts of the song she wants you to focus on, what words she wants you to focus on. I was and always... it's a very, very artistic way of doing it. Yeah, I, I actually, my funny you mentioned that, because I was always taught, you know, way back in, in uh, music theory and composition courses that, that well, that's the, one of the key things you want to try to do as far as a composer goes, you know, not just writing for pop music, but for a composer, write melodies that really elongate and expand beyond the measure. It's very easy to get caught within the measure and write within these these regular groups of four, right? The vast majority of melodies that are ever written are written that way. But when you experiment beyond that, that's when you really try to breach that barrier and make the uh, the listener more engaged and curious as to what you have to say and not just, just foot tapping. There's more to it. There's substance. But there is a pickup here where everything becomes a lot tighter. And this is where that, that Motown R&B influence comes back again. Um, and it's it's kind of like a shebang for the middle, uh, I'd say, two minutes of this. You rock back and forth between verse and chorus, but it's still very, very uplifting. Until a moment where the vocals start getting weaker and suddenly more noble. The instrumentation starts bringing in a brass section, a steady rhythm guitar, and then synth just to keep it somewhat ethereal because this is a, an ethereal subject. How big, how blue, how beautiful. Like, he, she's, like she's celebrating something. And it seems to build and build into a point adjoining with strings and, and higher range brass instruments where it takes on like this cer- certain majesty, almost like that of, of Aaron Copland, who is known for writing Fanfare for the Common Man and all that, you know, very expansive uh, themes celebrating the American landscape and such. This is kind of what I get from this, and how could you not with uh, her use of of French horns, you know, this very noble, rich sound. All of this, it just, 
it what started off as kind of like a courtesy backdrop element for that more upbeat section they grow in steam and this firm hand of the french horns and the playful trumpets like like eagles wings sort of flapping this is the musical embodiment of the words themselves how big how blue how beautiful and what kind of an like an awesome and an overwhelming feeling that is fantastic she can do that through music alone and then there's another section where she goes into just a simple guitar strum uh, accompanying her vocals and completely playing. Yeah, off that of was them. that was Com- in the midst of that of, of when she sort of it's, started it's, dying down before she built up again. And it, it's that combination of she can do the the song doesn't lose a beat, and that's the best part. Between these different sections, the song never loses its cohesion. It's natural progression from one to the other. But to go from just a single vocal and a guitar to true grandeur is. Just really beautiful. It's a kind really of, solid uh, composition. Kind work. of another case of all rise. <laughs> yeah, and but it doesn't all rise. It, she goes back and no, forth. No, you're right. There, there is that. There are recede, uh, receding parts of the song, which allows the rises to become more powerful. Yeah, it's really but just the final rise. From after that, then all of a sudden, it just goes to the end. It just goes end. and further and further. Until and like great. maybe the last 10 second outro where we have a, a sol- solo string outro. You know, and it's, the brass is gone and it's just the strings kind of like... You know, taking it down a notch. But this was so planned. I mean, and what a hell of a title track. We've had a lot of disappointments, I've noticed, as far as title tracks are concerned, where we're like, eh, you know, for the title track, doesn't really live up. You know, it's just like this, st- like what we experienced on the Stephen Wilson album. And, like, that was a great album, uh, Hand Cannot Erase. But Hand Cannot Erase, it's not the song that I would advertise for that album. But here, this is what I want to see. This this shows um, some kind of solidity of vision. Well, it also has my favorite vocal part of the entire album. In the second rendition of that chorus, how big, how blue, how beautiful. When she says beautiful for the first time, it's just magic. It reaches heights. I just, I, it, it's everything that we've been touting as her solidity in her vocal work, just personified. It's yeah. that single moment of the album that just cemented this song for me. Absolutely. Um, I, and it still continues to kind of give this structure and, and theme that kind of builds upon the previous theme. You know, this is kind of like after reeling from this these big questions, she's mm-hmm. just embracing how beautiful this actual world she's wrapping herself in is. How yeah. beautiful everything can be and how in awe of the little things even that Se- she is. Seems so celebratory at this point. And there's also, speaking of rapping, I'm starting to see a theme work because there's another line here or another grouping of lines that talks about, you know, not just pulling dirt, but here's another form of just insulation. And meanwhile, a man was falling from space, and every day I wore your face, like an atmosphere around me, the satellite beside me. Later, it's let let the atmosphere surround me. A lot of imagery already being presented of it's protecting yourself almost well, kind of like that earlier Some line which was actually, in a, it was actually in a previous song the earlier line uh, yes. wrap the earth around me exactly yeah, that, yeah. this is and this actually comes up a couple of times throughout the album so I'm already trying to come up with it's a still, story with this yeah it's still definitely linking to that that idea of how personal this album is and kind of a protection almost like yeah, giving and this it's, personal, personal stuff to protect herself which is interesting because in this case Creating an insulation with this song, with with what's being said and how it's being presented, sort of allows her to see the outside as a grander place. She's almost removing herself from it. Yeah. To be fair, though, I do believe this is all allegorical in yes. a way. Yeah. Because absolutely. for that, yeah. I mean, it's 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 funny though because I have the Aaron Copland connotation. That's where my brain is going to go. But of course, it's it's used to her own to her own advantage. Um, so for there, let's go to track four, Queen of Peace. And if we were getting some interesting storytelling aspects in the previous tracks, this one's another kind of a take on it. Because right away, the lines are now changing. The lyric style is changing. Oh, the king, gone mad with him, his suffering, called out for relief, someone cure him of his grief. First verse, right there, done. A lot shorter, a lot more clipped, and a lot more along the lines of a folk song as it's being coupled with some more 
unusual music for this album. Well, the, but, the song itself, I mean, the lyrics anyway, she's clearly telling a story. It's no longer about her or her experience or her perspective. It's someone else's perspective. She's telling their story. It also for very now. much sounds yeah. like the beginning, uh, I mean, which we really were hinted at a few seconds earlier with the intro that doesn't have any vocals over it initially. Yeah. And that's this very like cinematic. string intro, starting off with that like delicate tremolo. That's, that's a, a, a go-to cinematic tactic. But it all has this like exp- exposition surrounding it. It feels very romantic, it's cinematic, also almost like a little oriental at times. Um, and then, of course, you know, oh, the king. So it's it's an interesting way to suddenly like restart the album at this point. Granted, of course, we did get a hell of a an exit point at the, at the last track, if you could call that like an act or, you know, tracks one through three. But it does seem like this is sort of a second start. But then it's funny because the track takes another turn. We go into like more of a fist pump <laughs> well, it's, it's it, another one of those like alright right into the, the pop right here but this time it's a little bit it's a little bit um, more on the nose like I almost felt like she could have pursued that, that beginning section a bit pursued the, the string section a little well, further the, the, the goal I think structurally for this song is to kind of get that renaissance kind of feel I mean with the lyrics and the style it kind of goes into this folk meets rock style that it's I said rock and roll meets War of the Roses content versus right presentation it's an unusual setup i enjoy it i it's it's a modern version of an old school kind of a feel in a lot of ways because of how steady it is because it's solid in all the aspects that's going on right here nothing's really standing out musically but it's so solid and so integrated to one another that it's it becomes sort of a tale you can sing along with uh, I got kind of a split with that. In the verses themselves, I'll agree, I was kind of like still thinking like, oh, come on, expand that intro a little bit. And it's sort of just a largely a four chord progression until the chorus, which does take some newer directions. The only thing I might have really liked that stood out here is in the within the verses that, that the bass sounded a lot dirtier. I liked that. That was, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it was, it was strange because it's not a tone that is really frequently used on this album, but it, it stood out. Still, I do admit there is like this anthemic quality of this verse that, you know, it, it, there's a, a constancy to it, and she, I, I find that she returns to it a lot. Still, she knows how to work it, and this comes around big in the chorus, where she brings a beautiful melody, absolutely beautiful, and even the fist pump, frankly, does kind of manage to grab you after a while, or at least just fade into the background while you're drawn into the melody. There's something about this at this point, I realize there's just like irresistible pop. It makes you like pop through just its sheer presence. That's what her melodies have the power to do. And also, she has a capacity to change her vocals on a dime. There's like two stages to this chorus. Earlier, in an earlier phrase, it's effortlessly beautiful, effortlessly gorgeous, very soaring, and then suddenly it, it, it changes its tone. It's suddenly filled with empowerment. There's like a vocal shift there, uh, along with these beautiful chord progressions that bolster it very heavily, I might add. Um, but it's it's that vocal tonal shift that I notice she can change her timbre on this album. Not many vocalists can do that. She has the ability. What's interesting about these choruses also is that in the first part of it, when you were talking about the different vocals there, there's string swells that come up with it, which adds to that. That instrumentation adds to that kind of effect, that swelling of this chorus as you're going into it, which kind of gives it this rise feel. Yeah. And the words themselves, suddenly I'm overcome, dissolving like the setting sun, like a bloat into oblivion, because you're driving me away. Now you have me on the run, the damage is already done. Come on, is this what you want, because you're driving me away. And that's your chorus, that's over, the, that is the most And it does bring it back around to being that. personal, as and where it was storytelling in the verses, now it brings it back to her perspective, or she could be singing from the perspective of the king saying these things, too, is a possibility. And it's not so much the strictly metaphorical that the previous few tracks were. This is a little more allegorical. I mean, it's, it's the kind of ideas that you would have seen old-school Canterbury Tales style. Just just the way the prose are being presented, it's, it's another storytelling aspect with another vocal aspect with another sound aspect. I mean, this album, so far, keeps offering us just new things in new ways, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, and even later, I noticed, I don't think I heard this earlier uh, in like the first or second iteration of the chorus, but maybe like the third, there was another case of really, really great harmonizing, um, where that second vocalist, could be her, could be Issa, we don't know, um, steps in very, very faintly, just to like accompany these little 
thirds. I, th I think it was as she was saying, some things never sleep. Right there, I, I don't know, something about that. Just stepping in with thirds later on. It's, it's obviously that's kind of a, a go-to tactic. Well, it's like, all right, if, you, if you're not punching in the first or second chorus, which I still believe she did, then add something. Always, always keep them interested as you go. But I don't know, that was just one of those great moments down to the, down to the measure, which I like to point out. I think that the idea here is if you're going to go pop or fit a pop structure, at least give it some gravity so it has some punch to boot. You know, you can do a lot within that structure if you utilize the capabilities that are within it. And exactly. I think she does do that well. Um, from here, we go to track five, Various Storms and Saints. New contender for best title of a song. Yes. Um, I like that this song, from the get-go, starts out instrumentally and vocally very forlorn, croony vocals. She goes a lot deeper here. With... It's like a weak croon, but her vocals can never really be categorized as weak. I well, feel it's like... in a whole different genre here, right? Yeah. I mean, you got that sad twang of the guitar, which kind of has this southern gothic approach. You know, we're not in Motown anymore. And then you also have the strings uh, in, in the left ear just kind of building softly. Um, but the vocals, you know, are still... There's some, con there's some consistency here. I think they're still independent. They are more longing, I agree with that, but also filled with a more pious quality here. I mean, obviously you have the track that's called Various Storms and Saints. So you get the, the idea that a religious element is going to step in here. But, I don't know, here it, it seemed, it seemed much, much richer. It was present in the vocals. It sounded like she was almost at bedside prayer. I could see that. I mean, the and also this tone that it takes, again, we're back to that moment where you really get steeped in emotion, which we've gotten a little bit on this record so far, but this one really kind of finds a place and stays there. It doesn't break, it, break out of it hugely. It lets you kind of exist in this world she's building. I and, also have a moment that I should probably point out, because it comes fairly early on. And here's the thing about... about moments on this album. They're not the first things that I noticed. I had pointed one out in the previous track, but mostly what I'm I'm realizing up to you know track five here is that she's really, really much better at at building, at crafting backdrops and building slowly, gradually and tastefully. But there are occasions where she will have that spurt of, of an astute choice that he, you can't reproduce. It occurs within a, one of the second verses, I believe. The monument of a memory, you tear it down in your head. Don't make the mountain your enemy. Get out, get up there instead. You saw the stars out in front of you, too tempting not to touch. But even though it shocked you... Oh, yes, shocked. That one little, just random jump in the music exactly. to accompany that word. And yet, it's the only time that really happens. They don't it's, prolong it. It's just to And they emphasize. don't create a just whole new there, song off of it. it. No, not a new song off of it, not a new verse that copies it. It is a, it is a solitary moment, it, a great moment in, in a very sparing album, or it, it gives, it, uh, gives things to us in very sparing doses. Um, in this case, it was just she emphasizes that word, along with the guitar that joins in and accents very heavily, like a sforzando right on that one note, uh, synced with like a, a guitar echo effect. Um, the accent is very, very heavy just for that one moment. It just leaps out and then recedes, and she continues merrily along for the rest of the verse. Something's electric in your blood. I think it just adds extra impact to this track. It's really not afraid to kind of be in this this place. It doesn't feel this need to break out or, or take us somewhere else like she had done before. We just kind of, she brings us here and lets us be here. You have that one standout shocking moment and then just goes right back to it. Mm -hmm. And it does take us in one new direction, although this is subtle. This is not uh, something leaps out of you. This is not dropping the bass. This is another vocal uh, timbre switch, or rather, no, more of a rhythmic switch. It seems like earlier on she's still doing those very, very independent melodies that are long and crooning, they're dancing around the measure, and then later on she's a little bit tighter, she's a little bit more rhythmic, and, and I noticed it's more influenced by a kind of like R&B approach. Kind of like what she did do earlier on, but here, it's, it's more, I don't know, it's more piercing in a way. Like, she really tightened up her vocals for clarity's sake. And by tightening up, by approaching with that r b style, it also gives a more interesting eff emphasis because the soundscape is so quiet, because there's nothing getting in the way with that. It just showcases the words. Yeah. It's another one of those uh, opportunities she's getting to really just use her, her inflection and to use 
any sort of accent she wants to do to promote the story she's telling, promote the imagery, and the frankly gorgeous metaphors that are going throughout the song. Yeah, and she can also switch on a dime. And I mean, I, I think actually a few times she goes back, it's interspersed just as easily with her more soaring, like tearful melodies. So, yeah, this is just intricacy at, at its finest, especially for a more um, for a more low key track. This this whole track really doesn't leap out, apart from the single note that I mentioned. Uh, there is no there's no moment where it seems to go into pop territory. It's 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 uh. This is her art, her arty side. Well, Although it's not, you know, in the way that we may have hinted earlier on, I didn't expect Southern Gothic with them. Well, and again, it, it allows you to kind of steep in that place, it, it, the, especially the Gothic that you're talking about. It kind of lets this whole song be an emotional lead-up also to the next track, because the other track does have highs and lows, whereas this one kind of stayed where it was. The- yeah, there was no, like, dramatic build that we had that I had started to come to expect with her music. But we get dramatics mm-hmm. in, the, in track six, Delilah, pretty much from the get-go. Vocally, the song starts off with a really great call and response, where very clear, crisp lyrics of Florence, and then the response is either this backup vocalist, the female backup vocalist, Issa, or her doubled, but it's more echoey and in the background, uh, you know, in a classic call and response style. Well, if nothing else, this is definitely following up on the R&B thing. Uh, in fact, it's even soul, you know, in, in some sense, with that call and response thing here. At least that was very done, very much done in, in soul as well as Motown. Uh, the oh, backup was... singers, they kind of had that attitude, that punch, you know, back and forth. The, they're very regular, um, although her vocals are still very, very... Uh, independent and, and free, but the way they respond is with that like R and B, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's straight out of Four Tops, Four Seasons, Temptations. Yeah. It's very classic, and it's coupled with a piano work, solid builds of of just you know build working within the same sort of framework we're already expecting. Well, that's more of an interlude. Like, it steps back to the piano chords. They're very, like, solitary, very firm. And then it grows back into the full-on uh, Motown soul thing. But then the next time it does that that switch up, then it's more... It feels more rock-oriented. Which brings me into a, a question that it's about time I raise here. What genre is this? We've switched a lot, you know, and we're... we're we say Motown-ish. We say soul-ish. We say R&B-ish. But then Are sometimes the here it's record? just like... Just in general, For yeah, the artist. A lot of this tra- of this album so far, sure. Um, I mean, I would say it's as much pop as the other female artists we mentioned that we reviewed earlier. Well, they're but, described as pop indie, but then again, we also had this big conversation on how indie borrows. Yeah. You know, and indie so borrows from thing. everything, so they're what they need to be at any given moment. If this is pop, it's drawing from the history of pop. Well, yeah, sure, but I mean, I would, again... But that, that further just expands it into what genre, uh, because this song becomes just a rock ballad, a 1970s old-school rock ballad. Yeah, you can isolate moments where no, it's sure. like, yeah, okay, it's kind of a Motown thing because we have the association. But as a whole, this is, yeah, it's a rock ballad. Frankly, rock ballads in the 1970s were borrowing heavy, heavily from Motown anyway. But they had so, their own little, t- you know, turnaround, their own little exactly. phrasing that was Elton, separate. Elton borrowed, what, but then at the end of the day, he's just Elton. What I like about the build to this song, though, is it doesn't it doesn't have as slow a build as other tracks it had before. It's kind of got this soldier marching beat, this defiance in her singing, and I just like the way it kind of builds and gets this energy and kind of riles itself but up. But here's the thing. So far, it has the same pattern. It's the same pattern as some of the previous tracks. It has the mysterious intro, then the fun pop section, which builds in a big way, and it tasteful way i agree but then retracts then builds up again um and then there's sort of like this after the whole dance that goes on here there is more of a breakdown which is just the the single cello the right on the axe on the downbeats and that was pretty much over the final melody until the end so it it's kind of a similar form to the majority of the track from this album with the exceptions of track two and three i think other than that you know it's it's the same exact pattern uh, but this one, I didn't have the same... I didn't have, like, the a Queen of Peace, for instance, had the really, really strong melody. That's not the thing I honed in on here, in, in the case of Delilah. So I'm, I'm, I'm poised to be a little bit more critical, because this track comes as sort of the strange intermission between two very low-key tracks on this album. One is it's the, the previous, and the next one will also recede quite a bit. And we're also revisiting that theme I was hinting at earlier. With the pre-chorus... It's a different kind of danger, and the bells are ringing out, and I'm calling for my mother as I pull the pillars down. Right there, another reference to pulling things inward. 
It's a different kind of danger, and my feet are spinning around. Never knew I was a dancer till Delilah showed me how. Another, like, she's also now reaching out once again. She's she's becoming insular, but also talking about another being being part of her. Well, you were yeah. also leaving out the life. tail end of the pre-course, which also refers to going inward. Too fast for freedom. Sometimes it all falls down. These chains never leave me. I keep dragging them around. Still, it's, this this other aspect of her that she feels clung to her and that she's dragging with her. There's a lot of like emotional just weight, whether mm-hmm. it's emotions that she's pulling inward and protecting or whether it's emotions that are grabbing onto her. And there always seems to be an individual that she's reaching out to, whether it's him that kisses and creates a 20-year craze of love or whether it's Delilah that's teaching her how to dance and express herself and do something different. There's a lot of just like talking about the people breaking through the barriers of her life or creating those barriers. It's an interesting kind of theme I'm seeing throughout this album. Well, this might be another case where I'm split between musical arc and lyrical arc. I think the lyrical arc is solid. I believe there's the idea here that she is definitely just in a, in a, in a, a spell of drifting. Um, Well, she says that right at the outset, actually. I'm drifting through the halls with the sunrise. Hold on for your call. Climbing up the walls for that flashing light I can never let go. You know, the caught between a rock and a hard place, and essentially, or caught between, you know, good and bad, uh, good and evil, hence all the romanticism and everything. It's, It's a kind of purgatory in a sense. But I also feel that musically, while it attempts to match this sometimes... If you're just honing in on the music, it can feel a little bit aimless because the the recessions are there, there are those soft tracks, and then it builds back up again. But it it all it all feels like it's arbitrary placement of the more pop oriented tracks to keep the album interesting. That's if you just keep it to the music. Lyrically, I get that there's a, a concept. I think that her her lyrics and vocals though are so intertwined to most of the musicality of the entire record that. It's going to be rare that you're wanting to take them separately unless you're doing what we do and actually looking to take them separately. They are pretty closely intertwined. And also what I like is that her lyrics are very metaphorical-ish. Like, sometimes it sounds like she could be making a metaphor, but sometimes it could just sound like she's straight referring to herself, and it goes back and forth between them almost seamlessly, as if it could be both at once. But and to then- your previous point, I'm actually proposing the opposite. Not necessarily that it's like, oh, well, if, if you're... If you're looking into it deeply, you know, well, then you're going to notice all these flaws. No, it's actually if you're not looking into it deeply, then I feel that a a flaw breaks out. And that is one of those interspersed pop tracks, uh, excuse me, pop albums, trying to keep it interesting, but also trying to add that little dose of, you know, this is my best work, but I I don't want to lose my primary audience. In other words, a a little bit of, of downplaying. You know, talking down maybe to the audience. Yeah, I don't know that as as prominent is this record as you're presenting it, though. I feel like there are hints of that, but I think it's this is still not anywhere field of our Katy Perry's that we've done in the past. But no, it's my 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 critique is that I feel she doesn't sit with it for long enough. Okay, fair enough. From here we go to another slower track that Delilah breaks up, which is Long and Lost. And if we're sitting with something here, we're getting. Two huge changes, in my opinion. Mm. One, we're, we're back to a very simple sound, but the thing that strikes even harder than that is this is the first time I feel like she's approaching the vocals truly differently because they're not a croon. It's soft. It's quiet. It's a lot like various Storms and Saints. Yeah. But here, they're vulnerable. It's... They're exhausted. They are so, like... Purely weak at points. So it's not so. weak, faint. I would use the word faint more. Faint and almost sweet. This kind of um, purity that we weren't really hearing in the other lyrics. Well, look to be to be. I don't think it's un. I don't think it's unfair to to, to call it weak. Um, because that's that's kind of almost similar for lost. If you're lost, you're in a position of weakness. Yes, I agree, vulnerability is probably a better word, but that's kind of what she wants to convey and successfully does. I really thought it was another vocalist, another vocalist who doesn't really have um, maybe f- uh, Florence's punch, because that is probably what we're used to, at least right. on maybe 75% of what we just heard, um, and this is just really, really taking it down. But everything else, you're right, really continues very much similar to the track before last, uh... Storms and various things. This is that southern gothic feel. Um, 
kind of really makes me wonder where Delilah fell in the mix. That's why I was so kind of befuddled by it, except for the fact that lyrically she may want to convey this sort of back and forth nature. Um, but it did feel almost intermission like because this was so soft. It's like this is not the it's not the spotlight, you know, of this album. It seems like she has her spotlight on the more pop oriented tracks. Um, but yet she still also brings in some consistencies, like the R&B element, Never Leaves, that comes back here in the chorus, um, kind of an interesting answer to the Southern Gothic verses, um, I really hear that particularly in the percussion itself, that's what fills R&B, uh, to me in this track. Well, because the percussion is very heartbeat oriented, it's the first time we get this on the record and we get this a little more later, but it's kind of a heartbeat-esque rhythm, which is was very popular, of course, in R&B tracks, because the heartbeat would give way to this emotion and love and all that stuff. It's like and this one, a two, three, a four. But yeah. they're so quiet. I mean, they're not truly the the presence of but that also song. lends to a heartbeat. A heartbeat is, yeah, it's, is it's, it's, in the scheme of volume, is fainter than other thumps. And instead of getting it pounding in your ears like a lot of tracks try to do, this one is... You hear your heartbeat, but you're... It's subdued. It's, it's not you're covering your ears and you're really, like, you know, going stethoscope hearing your heartbeat like a lot of tracks have done in the past. This one, it feels like more of it's in your chest, not in your head. And we're once again revisiting some some very, very nice themes that I'm enjoying. Second verse, I need the clouds to cover me, pulling them down, surround me. Without your love, I'll be so long and lost. Are you missing me? Hmm. Into that chorus, is it too late to come home? Are all those bridges now old stone? Is it too late to come home? Can the city forgive? I hear its sad song. City is another reference that she, she likes to make here. It's it's just a lot of like honing in on the theme you know, of this song. You know what this That's reminds what I me feel of? Like. This reminds me of something. It, it almost feels like if we got... Uh, the Beatles of uh, Sgt. Pepper, she's leaving home from the perspective of she. It's, it's as if she were singing. She's leaving home. Well, that, that track really re- begins under the premise that she's gone. Yeah. You know, and it's a, th- it's a third person narration of, of what has just transpired. And it's very sad in the process. Um, also, it's additionally sad because it's not anyone's perspective. It's just this kind of cold third person observer. But then here, uh, it's almost like this is the girl who just left can the city forgive like that that desperately wanting to come home you know so long are you missing me that that kind of like uh childish or or adolescent desire like you know does anyone really care it's 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 got this going for it which is why i think this vulnerability is very very appropriate well yeah and we were getting those same lyric patterns that john is pointing out you know talking about covering herself and protecting herself this which vulnerability is... is throughout the record but here is where you really get an emotional vulnerability feel based on her singing voice and the structure of the song completely you you're the vulnerability hinted at throughout the lyrics of the other tracks but this is where we really kind of get inside that vulnerability before she manages to cover herself. Yeah. Yet, yet, for all the lyrics and the vocals, this is also... It's not the same level that Various Storms and Saints did for me emotionally. I just feel like there was more there musically that I connected to. So, while I feel like her words are most the most emotive on the album, her vocals are the most emotive, the music keeps it from being that true crux of emotion which sort of ends up making it a emotional reset for me for the album a sort of like end of which next act is going to be coming so up. the third act i yes. feel like if you consider this a, a second act it's actually it's not a far way to go i feel like it's almost a palate cleanser if you will it kind of like is preparing it's a really for... depressing and sad and lonely palate cleanser but it kind of gets rid of the clutter of the previous songs as well a positive, negative, this can be argued both ways. I'm going to take it a little more positive, though. Well, also, because her vocal delivery is so different, I think that's what adds the most strength to the track, is that we're getting something new vocally that we had not heard before. I would agree with that. And really, it's just kind of strengthening strengthening that divide that I see here between yeah. lyrical arc and musical arc. I still say that without all this, uh, musically, it's a little bit of a disappointment because you want to go deeper into these into these harsh moments. The music uh, that she's been able to fill in certain moments to, to to accentuate this, you know, it's just, it's it's not there when you kind of go back and forth through the track like Delilah. I want this for a, a, a larger bulk of this album. It's when she's at her best. But let's see where she goes from here. Track eight, Caught. 
So this this is the first kind of modern folky feel that we get. Steve said almost in the early chords it was reminiscent of a Decemberist track, which is not very far off. I it was like in the very, very first bar that it'll pick up. It sounded like it was going to go into rock, Rocks in the Box. But truthfully, I mean, that said, the structure of the song as a whole does have this kind of ageless, Decemberist kind of feel, this old-timey that's not old-timey kind of a thing. It's definitely going for that. There's a hint of country here, too. So that wasn't kind of a, a far-off thing to think immediately because it does kind of go that route. It's... So, it's very reminiscent of like old school classic rock, like tambourine rock, I like to call it. And there is a tambourine here, but it's one, two, three, slap, one, two, three, slap. That kind of beat that's that's present throughout really becomes a almost a tagline for the song itself and holds the whole piece together. But it's so familiar in this case that Well this is in that intro weird. this is in that like intro uh, hook section. And yeah, you're right, it also has like a bass that almost feels like it goes into that like nineteen fifties area. It's almost a walking bass, but not quite walking, it kind of has a strut to it and then all the ooze in the background. But then the verse it really slows down, it really starts dragging this whole like for one. For one. It's very slow in this depart it's it's just it feels like it's being dragged along and still kind of feels like it's returning to the gospel soul influence or gospel soul rock ballad, who knows anymore. It it's I don't know. There was something that felt like the track was dragging, but you have to keep in mind that the track is called Caught. I feel like it itself is kind of caught on thread, again following the same lyrical uh the lyrical arc here, and that is to say for the album, it's kind of like it's clinging to some of the same things that previous tracks were. Let's look into this. I mean, It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do, to try and keep from calling you. Well, can my dreams keep coming true? How can they? Because when I sleep, I never dream of you. So again, she's caught on a concept, caught on something that is almost not possible, or at least intangible at this juncture. As if the dream of you, it sleeps too, but it never slips away. It just gains its strength and digs its hooks to drag me through the day. See, I didn't even notice that. It has the word drag. I described the track as kind of dragging itself along. Here she has it right in the lyrics itself. And the chorus, of course, continues pretty on the nose, and I'm caught. I forget all that I've been taught. I can't keep calm. I can't keep still pulled apart against my will. Not being able to let go, I just wish, I wish that that split was not so present. Musically, this song drags intentionally, I know, but it's not a positive from a musical perspective. It's not so enjoyable in this way. I can only accept it on on lyrical, thematical grounds. But I still think that those lyrical, thematical grounds are pretty strong. And safe structure aside, it's still not a terrible track. No, it's not a terrible track. It's just, it's, it's it's a... it's a snoozer for this album. Fair it enough. Showed its, it showed its its uh, its colors early on. Fair enough, but still, I, I enjoy the tone she takes here, and I think, yeah, this is probably one of the safer songs on the record, because at least track one, though it was also somewhat safe, had a punch. This one intentionally didn't have the same kind of punch, because it wants to follow that ageless folk feel, which doesn't have the same kind of punch Typically. Well, I'll give you something else here, just to continue with the lyrics here, because I do love these words. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to prove. You turn to salt as I turned around to look at you. Old friends have said, the books I've read say it's the thing to do. But it's hard to see it when you're in it, because I went blind for you. And then you leave my head, crawl out of the bed, subconscious solipsist. And for these hours, deep in the dark, perhaps you don't exist. I can safely say that uh, Florence, as a lyricist and a singer, dances in and out of metaphor so gracefully that I will never, ever, 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 ever get tired of it. That no was matter a, what, I love the way you just put it. Dan dances in and out of metaphors. It, That's it, a perfect way to describe her. It's just the way she works with words. It will always keep me intrigued. So even those moments where the instrumentation does seem lackluster for me, as a fan of the band isn't as much of a problem from an artistic and from an analytical standpoint I understand what you're saying maybe it's appropriate that I happened to mention the Decemberists early on uh, in this track or that the track reminded me of the Decemberists is because we had this exact same problem back in episode 134 when we reviewed their album uh, What a Beautiful World What a Terrible World which is frankly you know thematically not that different either thematically not that different and also it's 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 Colin Alloy. Yeah. Lyrics, always a solid bet. Always yeah. a solid bet, but I struggled through a lot of those tracks. I knew it was not up to snuff or what they were always capable of. So I'm finding myself in a very, uh, in a very similar place right now. From here we go to uh, track nine, which is Third Eye. 
Um, what I like about this song and how I kind of compared it from the beginning is it's like if Florence and the Machine did a Katy Perry song better than Katy Perry. Now we've reviewed Katy Perry on the al- on this podcast, right? And she's still very, very good and has a beautiful voice. But... Episode ninety five, we reviewed the album Prison. With Afterbirth Monkey, um, Chuck and Mark. Mm-hmm. But this song, what I like about it is even though it has a similar structure and feel to that song, lyrically it takes it to another level. And Katy Perry is not a untalented lyricist. The writers who write for her write some pretty good stuff. But this is something on another level. That original lifeline, original lifeline. That original lifeline, original lifeline. We're already getting a theme set up for this specific song right from the bat. Well, that's the but hook that kind of right never there. shuts up. <laughs> but, hey, look up. Don't make a shadow of yourself. Always shutting out the light. Caught in your own creation. Look up, look up. It tore you open. And oh, how much. That line right there, not quite part of the verse, not quite part of what comes after. It's sort of like in limbo. It uses it as a transitional piece to the next section. So it's less verse, less words, and more just really letting her just be an instrument for once instead of having the instruments comp her. I, I want to actually, I want to clarify something at this juncture because I think I, I do think I need to make a distinction between the kinds of pop tracks in this album. When I say that, well, she has a more artistic side and a more pop side, that's not. That's not the end of it. She has a, a split in her pop approach, where sometimes, such as in the case of track four, Queen of Peace, uh, phenomenal and irresistible pop. I could I could listen to that for hours. Um, this might be a similar case because it is so unrefutably catchy, irrefutably yeah. catchy. This is it's it's heavy on the kick drum, but also there's a delicacy here. There's, it's filled with hope, the same kind of uh, hope you'd expect to get from. As you said, maybe a Katy Perry song that was more um, empowerment you know, well, yeah, oriented. Well, she has songs like Raw and Firework where are all about self-empowerment. And this finds that same kind of field. Especially when you start talking the chorus. Just the way she treats her voice during the chorus. Because there's a hole where your heart lies, you go to a rise. And I can see it with my third eye, it goes to a rise. And oh my touch, it magnifies. Bring it back down for the finale of the course. You pull away and you don't know why. Another rise. That just rise, rise, drop, rise is an excellent way to go anthemic yeah, with a and, pop song this or a rock sh- song or any sort of song. Just to set up a four-line four, uh, four line chorus and work it this way is sort of it has sort of survived the test of time. It's the way to really do it to... To really be anthem, to be catchy and empowering. And for that, I love her voice, but it kind of comes off a little bit, a little bit just sweet. Well, obviously the concept of a third eye, like, all right, you can see what others can't see. There's a sense of at least trust there. You know, I can see what others can't see. That's why you go to me. That's why you don't go to other people. And of course, there's a lot of, of, of self-help going on here or, well, help from another person. Hey, look up. You don't have to be a ghost. Here amongst the living, you are flesh and blood and you deserve to be loved and you deserve what you are given. And oh, how much. That you know, <laughs> I mean, don't you just feel grand? I mean, it's a, it's strong words, and honestly, to to have that kind of a pickup when emotionally she had been kind of waving back and forth on the record because just there had been some self empowerment, but mostly it was a lot of rumination. This is like kind of coming out again and just doing that kind of emotional grip where she's back in control but again still dancing in and out of metaphor and i think that's where the strength really comes through is that not only is there this uplifting rise that john described but the lyrics really lock it in and while yes um musically it's not super complicated it's not super original it it, steve's right it's absolutely catchy and engaging it pulls you in it's the good kind of anthemic and also the way it the way it wraps up too like almost not quite in a round but there was a lot of overlapping there especially even the way that each and every uh that each and every hook has gone back to well the original lifeline original lifeline and it's it's two different vocalists that kind of like call and respond to the exact same thing um but it it's you know it's a very grand outro in that sense i it's it's not my favorite. I still think Queen of Peace beats it as far as pop is concerned. But this, you know, I, I can see what she's doing uh, theme-wise. But from there, we go into an interesting thing. St. Jude. Now, this is artier. Yes. But you got to focus on the title here. St. Jude, which, as she says herself, St. Jude is the patron saint of the lost causes. Furthermore, it's also used in, in just 
situations of desperation. There's a common uh, call to, to pray to St. Jude because, well, if anyone's going to get you out of this, it's St. Jude because you're at, you're at your bottom rung. There's nothing else left to do. So why follow up the previous track with this? Uh, that, was, that seemed to be putting you back on the pedestal. Why come down again? Well, I think the partly reason why... It, well, partly rhetorical <laughs> no, that us. I actually have an answer for. In Third Eye, she's not talking about her being uplifting. She's telling someone else to get up, get off the floor, kind of keep moving. Uh-huh. Very easy to be positive for other people. I, as a person who is overwhelmingly and annoyingly optimistic, I'm often optimistic when directing it at other people and trying to motivate them and inspire them. When it comes to getting myself to move, when I'm depressed... I'm sunk, even if I am constantly still uplifting others. And I think that's clearly what this is. It was a moment of, that person needs help, put everything behind me, focus on helping that person, and now I'm left with myself again. I think that's an interesting interpretation. I'll even one-up you just a little bit to say that maybe it's still the same conversation to the other person didn't take. Mm. Because it begins, it begins another conversation with no destination. Another battle never won. And each side is a loser, so who cares who fired the gun? And I'm learning, so I'm learning, and even though I'm grieving, I'm trying to find the meaning. Let loss reveal it. Let's let loss reveal it. It could even be the other point of view of said conversation. It's an interesting take because obviously Third Eye did not take hold. This is definitely a little bit more of a downer. It's also... Also between, so here, so who cares who fired the gun uh, makes, strikes me as maybe it was an argument of sorts. Yeah. Um, it, that can be a metaphor in and of itself. Who started this fight? That, yeah, and it just, just doesn't matter anymore. It's also very much a, a, a callback almost to Long and Lost, but it doesn't have those, those very, very soft, exhausted vocals. This is more along the lines of her more force, forceful, croon-oriented, but still not the, like, the, the heavier, like really, really empowering voice. But it's got the prayerful element there. Exactly, For instance, now yeah. it's even more in the nose, because now it's just this steady organ slash accordion thing. Um, another one of those like Copland approaches, a more prayerful backdrop as a whole. Um, but I love the open, open intervals here. And even uh, the percussion that is present is very, very b- benign. It's just like... Tss. Well, the, the boom. Boom percussion is emulating that heartbeat again. This time, even more so. It's literally boom, boom. and boom, weaker, boom. and much weaker too. It, it, kind of hammering home the the emotionale of the song because it does have this kind of down. But the difference with her singing this time, and like John was pointing out, is it's low and croony again. But it's sung in a way as if she wants you to come closer. Like she's singing at a lower volume to kind of bring you in, mm-hmm. to, to make you listen more carefully. If Long and Lost was the person truly alone, here there's somebody else looking for someone. There is a sort of reaching out, trying to, 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 to touch another person. And I was on the island and you were there too, but somehow through the storm I couldn't get to you. St. Jude, somehow she knew. And she came to give her blessings while causing devastation. And I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I just had to mention grabbing your attention. While Long and Lost was very alone, very much a, a single person speaking to themselves, this is somebody searching. It's it's foreshadowing in a lot of ways. Well, it seems more genuine, I think. That that's kind of the way I came across. Not to say that you know anything anything up at this point was disingenuous, but it, this this is uh, well, obviously if you're at your wit's end, if you're out of desperation, you're going to find your truer self. You're not going to be uh pulling the punches. You're not going to be hiding anything. Instead, it's just, well, this is where I'm at. Um so for that reason, it comes across to me as more genuine. Uh, another thing, the, the pretty much last thing I have to say about this track is it's it's a really cool thing I noticed that she does, I believe, in post production. Um, I think it would be very strange if she actually did this in one take. But her vocal approach here is such that sometimes she'll really, really belt it in one moment, right? And it sounds like she's you know she's hitting this high note. It's gonna fade out, you know, and you feel like the echoing or the lingering reverb of that note has just been cut off or interrupted by another track of herself that then starts softly. Uh, Like, she needs to kind of uh, trade off her phrases. I mean, uh, a a lesser musician might do this simply because they can't do it in one take, but for her, I believe, in this particular track, it's very, very intentional because it it sort of conveys the the longing nature on one hand and then almost like... uh, in, in the blink of an eye, supplanted by something much more meek. And yeah. that's, uh, 
that that's the whole of the approach in this album. I also like how this mention of Saint Jude it's it it's so personal to her, and you can tell like it's not. Here's religion. It's in your face. Yeah, he's, she's not telling the story of Jude the Apostle. I mean, she's, she's not just doing that. mentioning. It just seems like a very personal connection to religion, which I think is important to mention because I like when artists do that because again, it's just another aspect. Whether you believe what they believe or not, showing this personal connection that they have to it, well, she, you can appreciate it. I believe she said in an interview that she has some go-to subjects, and those subjects tend to be uh, sex, love. Death and and religion. Uh, if if indeed she, not that she's necessarily, if, as religious. you said, really that religious, but it always comes back. She feels like there there's a lot of religious influence there because it does convey a lot of questions that people wonder about death, about the end, about things that you have to overcome. Because well, that's the embodiment of how people have traditionally through the ages searched for answers. So why not invoke that? Right, and I think that makes a lot of sense. From here we go to the final track, track eleven, mother. And we get something a little bit different from what we've been getting. Um, what I like about this track from the moment it starts is you get this kind of rock feel. This, you know, southern rock kind of... It's tropical even in, in yeah. little parts. It's it's swampy. It's yeah. Swampy. It's, uh, John I would descri- tro- tropical. John described it as a southern bayou. And it, you get this with key things. Uh, the guitar, for instance, is very bright, very twangy. Almost feels like it's being played like on an old uh, 78 or something like I that. I would say it's touchy. It doesn't know where it wants to hover as well. If it, it flits around, but it has it, it has no depth at all. Yeah. There's no under. Um, but the rhythm itself, that kind of provides the depth, and that's like using sort of this, this castanet sound that comes across uh, through the speakers as almost sounding like crickets. So with these two things, I and John both felt this was very like Bayou uh, entrenched. But there's also other things that we get here later on. I mean, the bass line takes more of a, a, a funk approach here. Very, very smooth. Um, it's another case of her just kind of, like, diving through uh, through genres. But in this case, at least, it's, it's, it's a more unique one. She's had some go-to things earlier in the album. This kind of stood out, especially as a, as a closing track. It's interesting. And then the percussion really kicks in, and it's a whole other notch on the belt right here because this becomes... Well, that's one really as, as grand as like how big, how blue, how beautiful track three, it's it replicates it, but in a completely different way. This is this is where we were getting Motown in track three. This is like real rockish. This is real heavy stuff going that on. It begins with the chorus with um, mother make me make me a big tall tree so I can shed my leaves and let it blow through me. Mother make me make me a big gray cloud so I can rain on you things that I can't say out loud. Oh, that's like, that's, this is, you know, Brothers Grimm kind of stuff right here. Yeah. Uh, also, I think very appro- uh, appropriate to, to tackle this, like, I don't know, deep south kind of approach, since uh, there's a lot of fables uh, in that environment. She also touches upon a lot of the lyrical content of the previous tracks that we didn't even go into in some of them, with lines like, No use wishing on the water. It grants you no relief. This was actually approached way back in the beginning of the album, What Kind of Man? And uh, lines like, I wander in the street, another reference to the city. She sort of does this to not directly reference much of the rest of the album, but to just as an aside say, this is a little bit different than what I said earlier. This is a little bit different from what I said earlier. Mm -hmm. All said and done, this is a great culmination and closing for the album itself. Well, I think what makes this a powerful closer, besides the instrumentation, that's very interesting. I mean, like I said, this is probably one of the strongest bass grooves we've gotten on the whole record. You get that rock and roll groovy bass that kind of really pulls you in. But also what gives it its strength is how powerful the choruses are and how this is not a subtle build. This song builds and blows out. And it and it really does it very... like. When I think of Florence and the Machine, I don't always think of a rock and roll band. But this song is like, this is a rock and roll band. They're playing their instruments like a rock and roll band. It was really cool to see. And it gave the the tail end of this record, the final track for sure, this power that I wasn't expecting. The full-on arena rock. I mean, with the, the distortion present in the guitar. Again, elements we haven't really gotten on this. It's, it's curious. And I, I should probably read the, the last couple verses here. Because, well, why suddenly now be very... Uh, out there. I put my feet into the fountain, the statues all asleep. No use wishing on the water, it grants you no relief. Mother make me, make me a bird of prey, so I can rise above this and let it fall away. Mother make me, make me a song so sweet, 
Heaven trembles, fallen at our feet. And that's a beautiful line right there. Make me a song so sweet, heaven trembles. And that, once again, maybe it's a little bit on the nose as far as religion goes, but just that idea, heaven trembles, is so powerful to start closing up the album with a, with words like that. Well, that's is, ballsy. That heaven's really going to tremble ballsy. you. Heaven's going to tremble uh, as a result of, of your you know steadfastness and, and empowerment. But, but the but pleading it, that's that what she you need. goes into. That's the thing. It's right pleading. After that. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's all the pleading here. It's not the case of, of um, we have risen over it. It's yeah. not the That's fine, not why this it's is done. Strength. It's it's as if that ways. music, that the, the distortion and everything, simply says uh, in no short order, "This is what we have to do." Yeah. That that's the only way. It was kind of again talking about these different acts, like track two and three. Their dichotomy builds into ultimately what. I mean, track 9 and 10 build ultimately into what track 11 is. You know, those two songs lead perfectly into this song. Those two sides of an argument culminating with what you have to do, whether it's what you want or not, what's right or what's wrong, this is what you have to do to get through, kind of really wraps up the whole record well and wraps up the last act really well. That and the fact that just time and time again, we're getting just a variety of metaphors going back and forth throughout the album all referencing very similar ideas without being repetitive without just saying the same words over and over again but just finding more interesting ways to talk about the city life talk about him who he is or the other individuals that are really touching in on this very very insular life that she keeps trying to make it's a, an incredibly enjoyable story that just doesn't get old from a lyrical point of view. From a vocal point of view, it's all over the place. It's gorgeous. She knows how to sing and uses every aspect of her voice. Aspects of the voice that I didn't know she had, that she may not even have known she had. I mean, it's that unusual, some of the things that are going on here. That said, there is a deficit of music, especially towards that middle th quarter, that, that, that last... Th three-fourths of the album it's not that I want you know the reinvention of the wheel every single time but musically it's it's kind of disappointing to really see a lot of the same things happening throughout an album similar builds going from let's go from A to B to C to D it could be the greatest build of all time but I don't want it over and over again I don't want a nice, sweet, quiet song over and over again that's done the same way. That's my big detractor. Musically, it's all over the place. That might be, that's a minor detractor as well. Like Steve was saying earlier, it's hard to pigeon what genre it's in. So a lot of times, unless you're really feeling the flow of this album, you can lose it because you're going from Motown to R&B to rock and roll. And as far as time is concerned, these things did evolve from one another. But as far as sound is concerned, there's a little bit of a disconnect going from song to song to song. And that's, a, no, that's something that does kind of break it up as you go along. We were talking about acts and interludes. That's, a, that's what you're talking about when you're talking plays, when there are major breaks so that scenes can change, so that actors can stop, change their paint, go into another role or just redesign who they're going to be on stage. That's not a full story in the same way, though. A story has a little bit stronger flow throughout, and for all the story that's going on here, the music creates hiccups, and that keeps the arc from being as solid as it could possibly be. All said and done, it's just very well composed, beautifully sung, I, I'm I'm kind of upset that I really didn't know Florence and the Machine before this, because I'm really curious as to hear their previous work. Four point three. It ain't upper echelon, and it's not really doing anything new musically, but it's so solid on the vocal and story aspects. I it can't be anything but you know mid to mid four level. Hmm. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head as far as the way I feel about this album genre approach I think that in some ways that illuminates exactly what my issue is with with indie lately that is 
I mean, there's almost a lot of things that I love about indie, but it, it really is a, a genre, a catch-all almost. A catch-all genre of borrowing, of whatever it needs to be at any given time. And I do feel that if Florence and Machine, you know, when they dipped into Southern Gothic, go balls out. If, they, if you're going to go into this little funk section they had in the last track, go balls out. If you're going to do cinematic, and don't get me wrong, this is really... John's right, expertly composed, but I want to sit with it for a while, and I don't, I don't know if I buy a hundred percent that these genre choices are intentionally disparate because of the disparate nature of the character. To me, that's kind of a a, a cop out. That's an arbitrary approach. I feel that they're they're choices. I, I don't, I don't know if I feel that these genre choices are always married. Sometimes they just allure me from a musical end. And then I, 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 they go in a different direction. Sometimes it happens over the course of the same exact track. There are a couple cases in this album where they are really, really tight, solid to back, uh, front to back, and then I, I can accept them wholeheartedly. Uh, that happened as early as, as track two and track three. Um, that they were just expert approaches. And then sometimes it's just the pop element. I think, frankly, I might be more enthused by the pop element here than the other tracks. I, and I mean this in the case where her melodies are the strongest. I think that those are just the ones that are going to be stuck in my head later. Um, it's, it's either that or the cinematic style, but I get the sense that that's not where she wants to stay. That'll just be the, the setting for a track or for this album. It's the interim stuff. It's, it's the place she wants to put you in that given time, but the stuff that really sends the message home or the stronger musical, that's actually uh, the really, really killer melody hooks the killer melody choruses because she writes them better than i've heard from any pop artist we've looked at from any pop artist uh, we've reviewed that's single-handedly really really what i'm looking for because pop isn't going away and i don't it's true i don't want every single artist out there to be this you know art uh well frankly it's all art anyway but i don't need it to be this expansive like you know i'm i'm ditching i'm ditching verse and chorus a good hook is still a good hook and if you can turn that into the best damn hook you can which i believe they do that's what i want it's just some of them and this was through the nature of this being an album where she had to have those really really downtrodden tracks and had to feel mournful and had to pray to a higher being at times it seemed almost i through those tracks, we did lose a little bit of that punch. It's really strange, because this is an album that is balanced in a sense, but through it being balanced, I don't know if the musical takeaway is quite as strong. It's, in a sense, maybe too balanced. I, I never thought that could be a critique, but I believe it is here. I think that when you consider the lyrics, which is probably going to be the same deciding factor here as they were in uh, our review of the Decemberist and Colin Malloy's lyrics, I think Fair 4.3 is a pretty good rating, actually. Uh, John gave it 4.3. I think I gave that Decemberist album, which did disappoint me musically, a 4.25 uh, or something like this. But there wasn't the composition there that there is here. Uh, I just wish that the last three quarters really didn't leave me wanting so much. Um, I don't know that there's a ton I can say that Hasn't really been said already. I will say flat out that I did enjoy this a lot more than I enjoyed the December's record, and I enjoyed the hell out of that record. I enjoyed I, the Decemberist now. So you definitely enjoyed that. it more than me, but I'm a December snob. You are a bit of a snob. It's fine. We are all Decemberist snob. Well, and snob in general. Yeah. We don't have to quantify it. All right? <laughs> For you, we don't have to quantify it. Yeah, but we're on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> um... But I think that, for me, as someone who was familiar, very familiar with their first record and missed the second record, and now this is the third, I think that, you know, I didn't have a ton of expectations except based on a few of my favorite songs from that first record. So that said, it meets those expectations. I think also musically, it blew them out of the water, because there were moments here emotionally that I got just as strong as that first record. Um, that said, the tropes that were mentioned are there, um, and I... I just, I don't know that it was a problem for me. Also, the reality is what John said, because of how strong the lyrics and the story was, and even Steve said this too, it's it's hard to fault this record because it's overall, at the end of the day, a solid pop record. And that's what we were looking for from St. Vincent and Bride, Brightest Diamond. But My Brightest Diamond, I mean, musically, was also just on another level, but not because she's better. It was different. 
I think that for me, especially as a vocalist, she's got some of my favorite vocals that I've ever heard, especially by a female vocalist. The only person who trumps her is because of my schoolboy crush on her, and I mentioned it last week, and that's Shirley Manson of Garbage. But that's less about the quality of all of their work and more about me just having a crush on Shirley Manson. I, I listened to her a little bit last week after you said that. Yeah, I kind of I crushed it now, too. Yeah, I figured. I searched a picture of her at you mentioned that. And you crushed <laughs> as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I have a thing for redheads. Duh. Anyway... But the thing about Florence and the Machine, I think, that really hits home for me is on an emotional level. There is no moment on this record where I'm left going, well, I don't feel anything. It just it doesn't happen. Some of the emotions have a stronger punch than others, but overall, it's still a pretty strong emotional record. And adding the story on top of it just kind of hammers it home. Um, I will agree that there were some songs that weren't as punchy or interesting as other tracks, but there were no tracks I did not like or there were just tracks I liked less. I do hate to say it, but there were some tracks where I I didn't feel anything. And I hated that I did, given that some were very strong. Yeah. So, for me, because I did find that emotional connection through and through, for me personally, I'm bumping it up a little bit. But that said, it's still not as strong as some of my favorite records this year, or even other records we've mentioned. I think it's an even 4.5. I think it approaches up Rashalon, especially vocally. She is unlike any other female singer, more or less, I've ever heard. Her range is unbelievable. Um, you know, comparable to how in awe we are of the spine on the male side. Like, very similar to the fact that she can go low, she can go high. She has this incredible range and emotionality. Actually, that's a very appropriate uh, comparison. The spine, I would say, is the male counterpart to her vocals. So, I, I for me, it's a solid 4.5. I think that, you know, it's still not as good as some of the best records we've mentioned, but that said, it's still pretty freaking good. Yes. And the theme of this wrap-up leads us directly into our discussion this week, something I was inspired to bring up, because with this album, How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful, we got an incredible storytelling experience, one that I would really liken to a, a novel in its expanse, in its just choice of wordplay, in its ability to really keep us shrouded in the, the mystique of what this character is going through, but really give us concrete details on the side. That's something that albums just don't do a lot of the time. Because when you start looking at how, what a lyric is going to be like in a song and what a novel is going to be like once published, you're, you're not so forgiving when it comes to the novels. You can't just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. You have to be more expansive in the theme work. And it's a little bit of a double standard as far as the storytelling aspect of these two different mediums. You, you get just to repeat yourself with music. And that's something that can really harm a story when taken out of context of the music itself. Well, it's also the nature... Of, of novels the fact that they can't really avoid it. They don't have that recourse. The spotlight is on the words. There's nothing else to, to really balance it out. There's nothing else to, to say like, oh, wow, the, well, the melody was really great. Doesn't matter what she was saying. Doesn't matter what he was saying. The, the, the melody at least held it. In the case of a novel, you're just looking at pure prose, and then you still have to read into the theme behind that. But it's a lot more... It's a lot more cutthroat in that department, and that's part of the reason why the double standard is held high. But I do agree, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good thing to propose, because I, since I was mentioning Colin Malloy earlier, I do firmly believe that if Colin Malloy ever wanted to start a secondary career um, as a publisher, and I do believe he's written like a couple of books, but of course that's not what he's going to be known for, because he's known for being a musician, um, so it's probably always going to be somewhere in the background. Nevertheless, he could, he's flat out Dickensian. He could put out Dickens-level novels. I believe that this is a capability of his. But, in and it's there, and it's, it's present within his music, but it's not, as, it's not promoted in the same fashion. Instead, what do we look at? We look at the Decemberists. We look at everything they do simultaneously because it is, it's, it's music. It's, it's, uh, it's not just poetry. That's not just what we're looking at. That's almost like a niche thing. It's something, if, if someone wants to focus in on the December's poetry, they can. Or they could just sing along to it mindlessly. But if you read the words, it's beautiful. Which so I do. I there do a is lot. a double yeah. standard there. Why isn't it held to the same uh, standard as a novel? As why, isn't, why aren't there awards for it? Or if they are, they're not very prominent. I feel like also, though, with lyrics, the repetition comes in because you have a specific structure that's 
at a base level expected from songs. Obviously, not all songs repeat a chorus and all of that, but at the basis level, that's what's expected. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus. So mm-hmm. repetition is inherently built into the structure. Whereas with novels, their inherent structure is introduction, body, conclusion on the basis level of an essay. But there's still structure. So, of course, it's it's not... You can't simply cop out on the fact that, like, oh, well, one is more freeform and, like, structure. In fact, the, no, no, the novel they just form have different has, structures, has existed fairly in fairly constant shape since the end of the 18th century. Um, there definitely are, are novelists uh, and authors that take that in different directions, but the forms are definitely... Uh, there's definitely a standard there that people hold them to. Furthermore, if you do want to take that approach, a, a, a better thing to really contrast it with is, is is poetry. And poetry, of course, follows up upon the same exact thing. It may not be verse and chorus necessarily, but there are lots of refrains. Except for freeform poetry, which is a whole nother topic, most forms of poetry, like songs, have a formula or a basic idea of what you're going into, whether it's the, the very rigid structure, syllable-wise, of a haiku, to the more freeform just rhyming poetry you're looking at just creating the right number of syllables or the right number of flow or anything like that but because there's no beat to it you can get away with a lot more in poetry you can be a lot more freeform i feel in a lot of cases because you're not going to want to harken back to repetitive lines which while in music can work very well also can detract from the overall just content of the lyrics but see, sometimes poetry is the natural precursor to a full written song. I yeah. mean, one of the most famous cases that anyone who's a fan of the Red Hot Chili Peppers knows, the song Under the Bridge, the chorus was written as for the song. But the verses were all poetry from Anthony Kiedis' personal collection that the producer had discovered while they were recording in that old house and said, we have to make this a song. And he fought it at first. But it started as poetry that became a song and that's why the verses and the choruses seem almost so separate because they were written differently and that's my big point a song like that when there's obvious leanings towards poetry and a more literary approach in the verses has such a disparate idea and granted I love that song verse, chorus, whatever but the, the having the chorus be just a refrain. You don't get refrains in much forms of poetry, especially things like the more freeform oriented stuff. It's it's so forgiving to just ramble with literature, to ramble with poetry, but to also have a different sort of standard where you can't just be reiterating the same points. But I have two points on this. The, speaking of points, I have points. <laughs> there are inherent to what you're saying. I mean, you can't... I, first of all, I would not fault a, a song simply for having a refrain or two. I wouldn't fault the prose itself for having a refrain. Yes, of course, that's a tool that caters partially to the music. I don't think that drags away from, uh, from the literary side of things. It, it's, you know, it's just a tool. The prose can still be there in a big way. But also, to your point, John, I mean, bringing that up almost uh, implies that, well, because poetry can be more freeform, that there are not, you know, freeform music. Uh, freeform songs. We have looked at a bundle of songs that really do not necessarily have those refrains. Or, if you're going to have a refrain, that can be done melodically, and a lot of times would have separate lyrics. We have read a bunch of songs where it's just a continuous flow of of thought processes, a, a continuous stream of consciousness, as we often interpret it, at least. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be that rigid. Very often, songs can experiment. So I don't believe experimentation uh, with structure is the only... Uh, is the only criteria with which to really like separate this um, double standard that we're identifying here, and I still do think it exists, is that, well, music lyrics is not held to the same standard as poetry. It's really the same exact things. You can be experimental if you want to, you can be rigid if you want to. Both poets and lyricists fall into, fall into both categories. But there's got to be something more to that, because clearly lyrics are not held to the same standard. Well, also, I mean, let's look at literature that incorporates lyrics. I mean, John can speak to this more than I can because I haven't really read all of the books because I don't like his writing. I don't want to hear it. I don't care. I'm not a Tolkien fan. That said, he incorporates a lot of music into his books. It's um, not I, It's not music. the same. It's not the same. It's singing, though, isn't it? 
It's singing, but it's a poetry-oriented singing. Oh, okay. There's never any like instrumentation even described in any of these songs. Right, we only get that in the movies. Yes, exactly. And it's created based and, on Lord knows what. And that's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Granted, that's a, a very unusual interpretation of what I would have imagined that sort of a thing for The Hobbit to be portrayed as. But at the same time, his poetry... And it was more poetry. It was sung. It was always being reiterated yes, as is... sung, but it was more of a poetic version well, while, of that. While, of course, this is fantasy, it's following on the model that, that was set, the precedent that was set in, in medieval times, of course, and even, even the Dark Ages. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course, even go back to antiquity. And that's the fact that, well, songs back then, a song didn't need to be sung. It was simply something in verse. Uh, you could tell a story through song. It wouldn't necessarily be be a guy with a lute there playing on your side, you would sing it. And you don't really have to use notes. You're simply reciting poetry, but it was called song. Like, tell us the song of how you um, defeated the army, or how you conquered the dragon, which of course would be a, a tall tale. But, still, same approach. You'd just be standing up, essentially orating it, and there would be a verse style. So song is an arbitrary fashion. It's simply, now, we associate it purely with music, but it used to be looser. I have an interesting question to pose then. Do you think that the reason lyrics and books are judged at different standards, well, more accurately novels, is because of length? I mean, I know albums that have been written as one complete song. The No Effects did it once where they had a entire album that was 30 minutes long and it was one track, one song. It went through movements, but it was technically one song. Do you think lyrics on that level, if they were all interconnected, because it's been a while since I've listened to The Decline, do you think that would broach a book more because of the length? I well, first of all, I already proposed poetry, and poetry is often very, very shorter. And if you add, if you added up, uh, certainly we've had some long songs, very, very wordy, uh, wordy songs, wordy albums. If you added all that up, I think you'd definitely get to the point where you had a short uh, po poetry collection. Mm -hmm. I think that albums very well could be treated on the same exact grounds because the length may very well. Uh, may very well reach that. And hell, if you're going to invoke that, well, then why not bring in the hip-hop genre, in which case you're really packing in a, a bang for your buck in terms of lyrical length. So, no, I don't think that's necessarily it. Well, there's also one of the most interesting conceptually forms of poetry, which I talked about, I, I mentioned earlier, the haiku. 17 syllables and you're done. And I've read some pieces that are frankly moving in... Five seconds, right. yeah, and, actually, and that's that's a very unusual thing to compare to something like a song. But that, like, well, now this is further proven the point. You're right; it, it really doesn't matter because clearly that's like you're saying a novel in one hand, but the haikus are judged on the same exact level. People obviously there's a, a, a brilliant haiku next to a really really crappy haiku, and people really really take this stuff seriously. If that those you know stupid five seven syllable haikus <laughs> can be judged so critically then no why not judge uh lyrics in a given song well then the other question i pose is comparing mediums maybe that's the problem for example as john will attest often people try and compare video games to movies and tv and then while the mediums are becoming more and more similar because there's expert level writing being done for video games because it's an interactive experience where movies are still fairly passive to the point where you're not controlling it, the mediums will never be identical, and Which so is, it adds that disparation. So people won't focus on the cinematic qualities of a game. They'll focus on the gaming itself and as, gameplay. And, and a, no, as that's, a whole. No, that's a fair comparison. That's a very fair comparison, in fact, because I do think it's a matter of spotlight. Because yeah. we have the music to focus on, then it's like, well, the lyrics are just one of the whole. It's really about the product that matters. And to be fair, yes, it's true. I'm not saying that, we're, that nobody looks at lyrics and nobody's judging lyrics. Clearly, a lot of reviewers do this to... Pitchfork Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, everybody usually has something to say about uh, lyrics, but it's a blurb in the grand scheme of things because they have other things to get to. Um, it's just a matter of when you do take it separately, if, if you were to take it separately, theoretically, it could hold up. So for purely incidental reasons, then both of these things are issues. Uh, gaming... Uh, cinematic quality or voice acting is not held to the same exact standard. No, of course not. But it very well could be. Very sure. well should be. So should lyrics. 
um, there's just not this academic community looking at it necessarily. Well, the- just a lot of disparate people like us, you know, who take this stuff seriously on a moment by moment. And we have our charts, but but what does it matter to the higher ups? And we've also said on the the podcasts our, ourselves. It doesn't matter what they're saying, it's how they're saying it in many instances. Today we raved about the voices that were going on in this album, but at the same time, I, I loved it because of the metaphors, of the choice of words. But so many times, the voice can supersede what's being said, and that, while, while re- uh, the inflection can tell the story in some ways, when there is a very heavy story element, you can't just do it by singing well you still have to propose the ideas of what's going on. And but, it's it's it it's a shame when sometimes that voice it doesn't matter what's going on, that the the words it, it just the accent can be beautiful. And yes, it can be beautiful, but it also can detract from the content of the words. Well, I have really split feelings about this. Because yes, you're you're right, it can detract the content of the words, and to me that's almost a waste. Because here you have this this perfectly written product, right? That might, you know, sell by the millions were it actually published, but no, because the the writer was a musician and that's what they felt this was the appropriate medium for, then they use it there. And if they happen to make that next mistake of uh, doing a poor vocal approach or simply uh, a, a vocal approach that doesn't really highlight the lyrics in any in any fashion, then no one's going to read them, even if you do publish them on the book jacket itself. So that's unfortunate. But the other side of this is the fact that I am a musician, and this is why I didn't really look at lyrics so closely, like, up front earlier in our reviews. is because, to me, it was just the opposite. People are looking at lyrics, and that takes away from the music. And I used to think that that was the bigger crime. Really, it's just a matter of in your perspective. There's a crime either way, depending upon what you care about most, and it has to just do with marketability and the way in which you sell it for these purely incidental reasons uh things may get falsely judged well i think also it has to do with going back to my comparison briefly a big argument also that said why video games are viewed in a different light and not to the same aesthetic or artistic pedestal that movies are is because it's a younger medium let's look at novels or the written word versus music the written word has obviously been around longer than music has Obviously, it's not as recent as video games are, but I think it's that same idea that because one came so much more before the other, it's always going to be held to that higher pedestal. And then also pop, yeah, and you're right, pop, like, it's not, granted, it's not so recent, but it's true that pop music and the way that we perceive it, pop rock, pop, even if it was pop jazz and old standards, it's no longer than 100, I mean, 100, 150 years ago that people start, like, no, actually, that's inaccurate to say it's really criticism. That's the key thing. Well, yeah. While it may have been done for hundreds of years, we don't, and it only may have started being put on uh, vinyl in the beginning, no one took the stuff seriously. Right. So many pop songs back in the 20s were considered throwaways. They didn't, even the musicians sometimes didn't care about them unless they were like really, really marketable, like Al Jolson level. But there's so many others that just like went by the wayside and are, and are lost to time unless you're really, really of the ilk. And they're simply not rated on the same way that we've been rating uh jazz standards and rock standards ever since the 1950s and now all of a sudden we start to take the product as a whole but back then pop music was it was a a toy and i think that even further proves my point because video games are viewed the same way video games were a kid's toy and are still often viewed that way when it's clearly not the case the batman game i'm playing now i'm currently playing batman arkham knight that game is not for kids it's It's, dark it's depressing forget that it's It's better written than half of hollywood right but that's what i'm saying (laughs) is so the games are not geared you know games are no longer a kid's toy they are geared towards an adult audience and i think you know it's the same vein no this is shaping up to be purely analogous yeah (laughs) i agree well there's also the big uh, thing in Hollywood where every video game movie, every adaptation of a video game to movie, has basically been terrible. But that's... There's very few exceptions. But there's a YouTuber who covered that on his... He has a film and video game analytical channel. Uh, his name is Matt Pat. Um, his theorist channel talks about how the reason all video game movies are destined to fail is because they will never be as interactive as the game they're based on. The game draws you in because it's interactive call and response. You have to do things. But now this is ironic. Because here we are talking about uh, genres that are essentially fusions of all these other things, all these other elements coming right. together to forge these two genres. Um, and as a result, we lose the individual pieces. 
But now it's funny because also movies themselves, you know, are also the product of many different things. The right. product of Books cinematography and, and of writing and of acting. But yet, the Oscars exist and we give separate awards for these individual things. I do believe they do the same thing for games uh, within certain communities. Yeah. There yes. are gaming yes. awards Absolutely. and there are, it Absolutely. is done for separate things. But is that done for the music? No. As far as you know? You so don't get best, like the way we do in our year in reviews and we give best. So the, Gram- vocals. the Grammys don't have the same level I don't feel. I, I, I'm pretty sure vocalists and lyrics are highlighted but not to the same extent I think that in a sense it would probably almost be uh, an insult in a way it's like well uh, best vocalist of the year meanwhile there was far more work uh, instrumentation wise far more compositional work it's almost like to the artist it would seem like well I'm dismissing everything else you did but I want to hone in on that. I, I guess. I feel like... We do kind of do this in well, our year interviews, but I don't think it's worth it. Well, the difference is also we're doing what the Academy does, where they're honing on an aspect of something that's a great product. You know, yeah. like when we're awarding something, nine times out of ten, when we're awarding our best of of the year, like when I pick St. Vincent, if I pick St. Vincent as my album of the year, I'm not saying that... I'm saying in that case, it's the whole package. But if also one of her songs is the best song of the year... It's not saying that the rest of the album's terrible. It's saying that that great product created this great product. And I think it's the same idea. The same sort of thing when we talk about moments, transitions, and lyrics. That's always been my favorite, especially once we subdivided from vocalist and lyrics, when we we separated the two. A organization like the Grammys, they stick to genres. They stick to country, classical, rock and roll, pop. They have fusion genres. They have, they talk about a lot of different things but it's always about within a specific field as far as what type of music it is right but they they're, they're, they're not also, they're not divisive they don't pick apart well, each and every element they're not afraid to get hyper specific about ridiculous things though and they're also approaching it from taking all the music everywhere that was produced this year and gain notoriety in a lot of cases and there's critiques for that but what makes the best solo pop song of the year why? That's why I like what we do. I like going lyrics because lyrics are an integral part of so much music. Or best historical album. It's like, well, why? I mean, yeah, <laughs> why is that a category? Why, why is that a separate entity? And what makes it the best historical? What makes it the best classical? Granted, this is That's just a thing. sampling of the Grammys, but you know, I'm sure there are other awards out there, but it just does not seem like people are really honing in on these things. Instead, it's it's very easy for things to get lost in translation. And I, think and I, I feel like that's the, the, the ironic learning curve that we've done by merging together so many elements that it takes to make a whole because we were worrying about the whole. It, it's not necessarily that I'm proposing that there be some kind of giant change here, but... I do think it's easy to to get caught up in what gets lost in the mix, and that is a fault on our part it's for not being so, uh, you know, particular. And even in book awards, going back to novels, going back to literature, the same sort of thing happens. If you want the best science fiction and you look at, like, the Hugo or the Nebula. I mean, you're looking at what was considered the best new author of the year, the best science fiction novel of the year. Once again, they're not talking about, well, is it because of the characters? Is it because of the setting? Is it because of the, his, his choice of words? What are the aspects that give you the best poem, the best author, the best whatever? It's, it's cop it's, out. So merely talk about why it's different as opposed to what it's doing. That's essentially what genrefication does to all exactly. these different mediums. Yeah, I think ultimately what Steve touched on based on my comparisons is ultimately what we're getting at. I think because not necessarily the arts are young, although they are these arts that we were comparing them to, but the criticism of them are so young and we're so specific for so long. Like the fact that we, with a microphone, can give out awards that we feel are as important or accurate as the Grammys, if not more so, is the the, the fact that the critic the critical medium of how you analyze is actually still very much in infancy. I was actually listening to an episode of the Nurse Podcast with Ben Folds. It was his third time on the show. So at this point, him and Chris are old hat talking about stuff. And Ben Folds said he's never heard a review show or a review where they actually analytically look at the work. It's this sucks or this is good. Of course, I commented on the site saying, hey, our podcast, we actually do that. And we did your album. But but he makes a good point. A lot of the famous criticisms and criticizers are very 
personally influenced. They're not as analytical or looking at the big picture. And I think that's where the real issue is for these mediums. It's not the mediums themselves that are inherently problematic. It's the way we criticize them. It's the them. youth of criticism in that department. And actually, there's an exemplification of that uh, via its polar opposite. And that is, for instance, uh, one example, how immensely critical the world is about such vast works such as, like, oh, Star Wars, you know, or Lord of the Rings, these all-encompassing things where everyone and their mother has an opinion on. You know why? That's an epic. Criticism amongst epics has been around for thousands and thousands of years. It's an old form of criticism. So all of a sudden, there's not that same, you know, debate. Of like, I don't think we're looking at this thing. No, you name it, it's been reviewed about Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, or dare I say, go back, you know, to the older epics, the Odyssey. People have written treatises on the subject. But you're right, for more recent things, it's just like, uh, I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't know who's going to care. But at least we know that people care about epics. They're probably our most important and our most trusted and our just our go-to form of, of media and fiction. Fair point. And so I guess we, we started as, you know, let's compare, you know, words in one form towards <laughs> another. Just ended up being we have to start delving into just taking things apart a little more critically. That, that's, that's the crux of what's going on here. It's not even more critically, but in, within a structure of criticism that allows everything to get a fair shake. Yeah. And you, I mean, look, whether you like it or not, Britney Spears should get the same treatment that, you know, Vivaldi would get. You know, you want, you want to give an open and interesting criticism of anything if you're doing it. Right. The case, uh, the really, the, the the flaw is the things that go under the radar. Yeah. It's just what things do not discuss, and that's that's the problem, essentially, is that there are just some areas that society chooses not to look at, because if someone didn't consider it to be of importance, it may very well be of great importance. Um, before we go on to next week, Steve, do you have anything to deliver us for the end of this episode? Even though I did promise Star F that you would read his thesis, we will not do that tonight. Maybe next week. M- maybe. Yeah, I got I to gotta work up steam for that. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. So, so I'm going to assume you mean spam? Yep, that would be it. Oh, we're back to that. <laughs> what a great way to start off the new season. That is not an easy question for someone who has never tried jailbreaking before. Absinthe is completely free, although you can donate using PayPal. When I stream Netflix movies on Netflix Instant, I just feel great about having quality movies on demand, streamed to my pimped-up home entertainment center. I use my PS3. That was five ads in one. I know. And two of them were the same ad at different angles. That was, yeah, that was curious. But he does seem to kind of have a, have a, a bent in his name. Um, Ivasi on Jailbreak. So goes back to Jailbreak, the first one. Fascinating. Okay. Well, he's multifaceted. See? Again, Absolutely. AI. Do you really need forms. to jailbreak anything nowadays, considering the modding community for everything that comes out instantly? Good point. Seriously. John, what is your album for next week? Okay, I've... Okay, true story. I heard Queens of the Stone Age No One Knows sung by this duo, performed by this duo, and had no idea it was that song until... It, it went into the chorus, and I was like, whoa, okay, we're doing this. Con- and I had no idea until I was told. <laughs> Contemporary jazz artists, Twin Danger. I debut album, the first album, self-titled, Twin Danger, came out, I think, less than a week ago. This is like brand new jazz, as brand new as it can possibly be. And they're working alongside individuals from Miles Davis... Sting, Steely Dan, all these different artists joined on this album. So this could be something extremely interesting. There's definitely some kind of famous connection to these artists. Steve, you've got a spiel well, ahead of you. Stuart oh, Matthewman. Oh. I'm Stuart, writing listen, now in my head. Listen, Stuart Matthewman, a longtime guitar saxophist with Sade, and then Vanessa Blay, who also does vocalist and guitars, is the daughter of jazz pianist, Paul Blay. Yeah, I'm a student of music and all that, but you say saxophist? Yeah. Saxophonist. Syllables are hard. No, I, I was actually thinking for a second that I was going to learn something and <laughs> say, like, no, they're not actually called saxophonist. Actually, in the industry, it's saxophist. No, John was just wrong with words. Uh, it happens uh, quite often. On that shock- hate being right. <laughs> <laughs> on that shocking bombshell, we will say goodbye. And remember, music is life. And, and life, life is, is good. good. 
If you enjoyed this and other album analyses, topics, and guests, please subscribe to the Crash Chords Podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. For more media, also subscribe to Matt's one-on-one interview series, Crash Chords Autographs. To receive emails on all new content, subscribe at the top of our homepage. Also receive updates by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. And remember, keep the discussion going, because music is life, and life is good. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them in the comment board below each post. Otherwise, email us directly at admin at crashchords.com.